Angela Ray. What's up? Thank you so much for coming on the Uniweb interview show. Angela Ray, actress, speaker. You know, I, I have a, a f- couple of books. Uh, one of my books is called Rays of Motivation. It's an inspirational book. And Ray of Motivation number 35 states that you should celebrate on your drive to the end zone because a touchdown only lasts a few seconds. Mm. And so I'm a big sports person. And if you know anything about football, if there, you know, you watch football, you recognize that even though the touchdown, you know, everyone wants to score, everyone wants to get into the end zone. And, you know, when someone gets into the end zone, they're throwing the ball down, they're celebrating, they're doing all the crazy dances, they're, you know, high-fiving their players and the fans in the stands. But when you pay attention to football, as you're going down the field, you see players celebrate all the way, whether it's, you know, mm-hmm. a, a great receive, you know, they, they got, you know, 20 yards on that catch, uh, whether yep. someone was able to sack the quarterback or, you know, intercept the ball. All of those are celebrations before you ever get to the touchdown. And so particularly in this career of entertainment, there are a lot of things that I have that I can celebrate that may have nothing to do with me being on a television set or, you know, on the big screen. And so really learning to celebrate every single step along the way really makes a difference. Because if you wait to celebrate, number one, you're not feeding that motivation that you're going to need to continue. So that would be the thing that I would say would be to celebrate on your drive to the end zone. And that's not even just for actors. I mean, that's for, you know, anybody in any career, um, definitely celebrating on your drive to the end zone. And I would like to let everyone know how they can connect with me outside of uh, Twitter. Um, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, as well as Facebook at the Angela Ray. The Angela Ray. Yes. How did I miss that you've written you've written books? I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> this is my first day on the job. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I'm looking at all your I'm looking at all your acting stuff, and it's like you've it's so. <laughs> this is live. No, this isn't. Like, so you, you've written. That's amazing. You've written the book. I love that. Uh, celebrate on your way to the end zone. Um, where can we find your book? And what was the name of it again? That book is called. Let's see if we have it. It's called Rays of Motivation. And this book is ah. actually on Amazon. Um, I and so you can get it on Amazon. This is my latest book, which is actually a second edition of my first book. Right. Um, This is Blackberry Whispers. It's a book of poetry and April is National Poetry Month. So, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of promotions for this book. And then my second book is a book based on my acting career, but it is targeted to high school and college students. And it is called Mega Star Student Leadership. Lessons I learned as an actress that can help you lead, achieve and succeed. So I could have just read your book. We didn't even have to talk. (laughs) (laughs) Wasted an hour of your time. I'm sorry, Matt. I mean, you just oh, have put so notes in the book. <laughs> My bad. I should have just slid that in your DMs. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I know. What's the deal, <laughs> Angela? The uh, so you've written you've written three books or four books? Three, three, three. Two poetry. One poetry that so poetry. Blackberry Whispers. This is just the second edition. Second edition. I wrote the first time in 2004 updated it took some poems out put some new poems in repackaged it and so it is now available again that's amazing uh, i'm so caught off guard so many, no it's great i because the writing process is how do you find how did you find time to write in in between uh doing all this other stuff so i started writing poetry in middle school, my middle school years, I was in the seventh grade. It really started off of a dare. Uh, we were studying poetry. I don't even remember exactly what we were studying. And one of my classmates, Amy Pendergrass, she looked at me and was like, write a poem. <laughs> yeah, she did. For real. For real? You know, she, what she, she asked me, she said, can you write a she said, can you write poetry? And I was like, yeah. She said, well, I dare you to write a poem. I said, well, what do you want me to write it about? She said, write a poem about a crush. And I was like, okay. So I wrote it. It was like, I think that I was walking down the hall your eyes met mine. A crush came upon me because you were so fine. Okay, that's seventh grade poetry. That that literally nice. is the first like four lines of it. And it was horrible. I... However, 
I Sexy. realized that I enjoyed that process. And so um, I continued to write for, you know, throughout school. I mean, literally had a notebook that I kept under my bed that no one knew about. And then in college, I decided to take a, get a little bit more serious about it. And I did take a poetry class to kind of hone those skills. I like that. You were like seventh grade. I'll write a poem. You this wrote exactly. it. And then you were like, I love this. <laughs> <laughs> That's this exactly is what happened. This is amazing. <laughs> That is exactly what happened. So um, <laughs> that is so yeah. funny. Yeah, that's that's a blessing. The <laughs> I mean, Amy doesn't even. I don't even know where Amy is. Like, we've not connected on Facebook. Like, I've connected with a lot of people on Facebook yeah. from school, but I don't know where she is. But like, she doesn't know that I give her a shout out. Like every time I tell this story, I don't even know where she is now. How come nobody ever dared me to do something like that? Like they were always like, I, I dare you to eat this gallon of hot sauce or right. something stupid. Like they weren't like, Matt, I dare you to try and become a gentle soul and create work a work of art so that the whole world can appreciate your talent. <laughs> so like they were like, I dare you to run into that goalpost without your helmet on, Matt. <laughs> like, right. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, you know, what's funny is I never, who knew that a dare to write a poem about a crush, because it did seem kind of silly at the time. Yeah. I didn't know that that was going to lead to eventually me one day writing a book and, and you know, doing spoken word poetry. I mean, there was a time where I combined the poetry with the acting and I was doing what's called like competition poetry. And I was competing wow. in all these poetry slams all up and down the East Coast. And I just got tired of it. It, it's, it was tiring. But I mean, that was a part of my performance for a while. I was doing that and that was fun. It was. It well, was that's a, more like freeform poetry too, because you're not just you're not. Are you using stuff that you've already written? Or are you having to come up with stuff on the spot? It's uh, no using stuff that you've already written. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I was just imagining it like freestyle poetry battles. <laughs> you know, there is some of that too, <laughs> I, but nah, I wasn't. That's, that was that's not my skill. <laughs> that's tough. I was gonna say we could go right now if you want, but. Nah, you gonna Drop try a few to bars? Do no. I mean, yeah, you got bars, man. You got I bars. Got I got some. I got some protein bars in the pantry. That's the only okay. bars I got. I got you. So we can we can get all these books available on Amazon. Actually, Blackberry Whispers is at blackberrywhispers.com. I don't have I, it on Amazon at the moment, but okay. Um, I'm gonna we'll I'm gonna uh, provide links to all of your your books and um your websites and your social media and the description of the video below okay. so people can um lovingly annoy you <laughs> for all hashtag the tag lovingly annoy on the t-shirt hashtag baby <laughs> that's right words come out of your mouth and they're gorgeous i've seen some of the things you've spoken <laughs> on stage inspirational motivational you've also been in um, some of Medea's movies, uh, Tyler Perry's Boo, Medea's Boo, and some of his television shows as well. You've been in Atlanta, and the list goes on and on. You've been in a lot of stuff, and like I was saying before we started recording, I was surprised you reached out to me because you're successful and you wanted to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> how well, how are you doing today? You. And I'm are you good? Have you lost your mind? <laughs> Is that why? Yeah, I have not. Okay. I have okay. not. Hopefully. Anyway, okay. we'll see by the end of the interview. Yeah, it, I've been known to help people lose their marbles completely. Okay. All right. <laughs> so you're you're very, I, I feel like you're a very accomplished actress. Um, also a great speaker. I've seen some of the stuff you've done online. When did you get into acting? I got into acting, uh, just a little bit of a toe into acting in uh, my middle school years. I was in an organization called Forensics, which had nothing to do with crime scene investigation or anything related to figuring out how someone died, but it was a speaking and performance group. And so that's where I first dabbled into comedy, was horrible at it the first year. And instead of keeping with it, I was like, you know what, I'm going to try something different. So I went over to drama where I started excelling. And so I thought, wow, I'm going to be a dramatic actress. And then lo and behold, uh, once I got into film and television, I did start doing some comedy. So it was nice to come back to my first love. Comedy is so much fun, isn't it? It is. It really is. It's like, it's like magic. There's... If you do it, if it's like if you know the proper spell, you can make anybody right. laugh. Yeah. 
It's, it's all so about timing. It is all about timing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> See? There you go. There it is. It's nailed it, baby. <laughs> oh yeah. So so when did you when did you first get into like I know you started when you were when you were younger, but how, what was your what was your process like? I mean, what was the first I guess thing that you landed or role that you landed to get into like somebody else's film or somebody else's television or commercial or, or what was it that process like for you? Okay, so I I think I had done like a, some indie stuff. I don't even remember all of the indie stuff I did. I remember I did a film with a young lady. Uh, oh my gosh, we were out in the middle of nowhere in the mountains of North Carolina, and I don't. Oh, I can't even remember the name of it, but it was it was a short film. I think uh, I remember seeing it one time. Never got a copy of it, but I remember seeing it at a hotel. No, it was a motel. Definitely was not a hotel. It was a motel. <laughs> and the reason that I know that it, there is a difference, and the reason I know it was a motel is because we didn't have a telephone in our room. And you know what else? You know what else? The difference between a hotel and motel. Motels mm-hmm. always have wet carpets for some reason. I don't know why, yeah, but yeah. that's a fact. <laughs> I don't remember. I just remember. Unfortunately, the last day of shooting on our way back to the hotel, we got into a, an accident with the the van that all the actors were in. Oh no! And um, it wasn't. No one got hurt really badly. We had a couple people who had minor injuries, but I remember getting back to the motel, and because there weren't phones in our rooms, we and we were in the middle of nowhere. No one had service in terms of cell phone service. We had to go to the owner's house. And so the people who owned the motel lived behind the front desk. That's where their house was, their living quarters. Nice. And so, yeah, that's, that was, That's yeah. very, like, what was that What was that movie where he's, like, in the shower? Like, Psycho. It's, it's, it's psycho, very Psycho-esque. Yeah. <laughs> it was. It was not a fun experience. But in terms of something that someone would have actually seen me in, I was fortunate to do a television movie called Miracle in the Woods. And that mm-hmm. movie starred Meredith Baxter Burney, Della Reese, as well as a very young Sanaa Latham. Um, so young, in fact, that I had never seen her in anything. I'd never seen her before. But after we did that movie, she started popping up everywhere like, wait a minute, that lady in the wood, wasn't that the lady I was just in the you know movie with? And <laughs> the lady that's in The Best Man and, and all these movies. So it was very early in her career. But uh, and all my lines got cut, but they kept me in the movie, and I I still maintain my credit, so which was cool. That's the important thing, right? Getting that, that is, credit. Getting that credit, so you get those residuals. That's right, and yeah, also yeah. to like, so have you always been based in Atlanta? Or I have been based in both North Carolina and Atlanta, and I still kind of travel between both of them. Is is North Carolina pretty big for uh, filming as well? It used to be. It used to be bigger than Atlanta, if you can believe that. But uh, from a political standpoint, their government decided to pass some laws that basically banned their film incentives, which is why people were coming to North Carolina to film to begin with. And so Georgia, the state of Georgia, put some stronger film incentives in place. And that's when the film industry in Georgia started booming. It has boomed in like the last six years or so, right? It absolutely has. Have, yeah. So have you been doing most of your auditions and finding parts here in Atlanta? The majority of them have been Atlanta. Atlanta, some in New Orleans and some in the Savannah area. Although I just came back from Tallahassee. Yes, yes, what's today? Yeah, two days ago. <laughs> what are you working on right now? I was working on a short film called Counterfeit. I was playing a drug dealer's mom, which is a little bit different from what I normally do. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah, I've seen some of the the stuff you've done. It's it's funny. Um, you've got you've got a good straight face. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. Like like you, you can drop. I you, got you. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Like you can drop. Like I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at that like, doing the Angela Ray impersonation. <laughs> I don't think so. Like I <laughs> like I was watching the reel with the Tyler Perry when she was like trying to get the uh, trying to get the apartment. Uh-huh. And you were like, I don't think so. We are. <laughs> that was so much fun. Like working. That was my first sitcom. I had done comedic plays and had done uh funny roles and plays, but that was my first sitcom. And so to get a chance to do it with Tyler Perry, who is a comic genius, and 
who gave me the room to really kind of bring my own interpretation to the role and then, you know, help guide me to to what we had an opportunity to see in the final product was really cool. That guy has written so many, so many amazing screenplays and, and theater plays and just funny television shows is was that television show your way to uh, getting to know Tyler Perry? Was that your first time that working with him? That was my first time working with him. Mm-hmm. And that got you into uh, working with him in the movie as well? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's pretty amazing. I, I can't, I mean, for somebody like me who's never done anything cool like that, that's it's just like, it's mind boggling to think about. Were you, how, like, obviously this has been something you've wanted to do for a long time. But was it ever something you saw yourself like, I'm going to be working with these people, like I'll be on this level? Like, did you did you visualize? Because I know a lot of actors talking about that visualization of where they want to be. Did you have that? I don't know specifically visualization per se, but definitely talking, you know, talking and affirming, you know, working with certain people and putting it on my vision board. So I guess in some ways it is visualization, but I definitely have had some people on my vision board for a while. Yeah. And, uh, that vision board is, I, I have one, I'm looking at it right now, but I, speaking of that, your, your speak, you, you go out and speak, you do, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, keynote speak speeches, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So how, how did you get into giving speeches and, and it's inspirational and it's filled with God and, and praise and that kind of thing. How did you get into that? So I first, is this funny? You mentioned that and with praise, I really got started speaking in the church when, now I don't remember this, but this, the story is legendary and everyone adds their own spin every time they tell it, but legendary. legend has it that when I was three years old, um, I gave my first speech in church and literally it was happy Easter day. That was the whole speech, but you know, three year old, I, I couldn't read. And so my mother told me what to say, you know, had, you know, rehearsed it with me at home. And before I got up to go, I, you know, she said, say it really loud so everyone can hear. Mm-hmm. And so I'm three years old. I'm probably, what, two foot one. And I, I make my <laughs> way up to the front of the church. And apparently I said it so loud that the entire church fell out laughing. And so I'm assuming <laughs> oh, <laughs> I bet that was ended. adorable. I wish that someone had captured that on tape. But um, uh, apparently something in me must have been like, oh, when I speak, people like it. And so That's I right. continued giving speeches in church. I was fortunate that my church actually had some public speaking contests. So I was actually able to represent my church and my entire district at a state competition by the time I think I was in about ninth grade. And at the same time, we had some public speaking contests in school. Mm-hmm. So in the sixth grade, I represented my state and the district in a contest. And by ninth grade, I represented the entire state of North Carolina at a national competition. Wow. Wow. So um, I was like, this speaking thing is pretty cool. So I studied speech communications at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Shout out to all my Tar Heels around the world. (laughs) And yeah, and eventually landed a a long-term contract deal with Monster.com to go out and speak to high school and college students around the country. That is amazing. That's something I want to do. It's it's so cool. It sounds like you've been living in that gift your entire life. Like it's just... That's got to be, it's got to be like a, a life full of grace where you're able to live in something that you're so talented at from three years old, basically. <laughs> and not really realize that that's what I was doing, though, because right, I, yeah. I think that at the time, especially right out of college, I didn't think anyone was going to pay me to speak, even though, you know, at that point I've been speaking, as you said, pretty much my entire life and I had a degree in it, but I still didn't think anyone was going to pay me to do it. And uh, it just took some time to learn some of the business side. I mean, it's, it's almost like with acting. Acting is a part of show business. And there's the show. Right. You can train on, on how to be great on stage and in film and in television. But there is a business side. And I think that's the one thing that I was missing even outside of college was the business side to even speaking. Well, that, I'm glad you brought that up because I do want to ask you about this. When you because you've been doing you were doing it your whole life. And I'm sure it was something you felt like you were good at and it didn't even it didn't even register to you necessarily that um you were doing anything special it was just like this is just what i do when somebody wanted to pay you for it was that was that weird for you 
it wasn't weird uh, at all. You were like about dang time. <laughs> right. Like, yes, this is what I've been working for. And, you know, then even learning what I should be paid, you know, yeah. based on, you know, what I bring to the table. So even that took some time. But, yeah, it was just like, finally. Um, yeah. I, I Like, I have, like, all of my first checks. I have my very first check from having a real job. Well, I have the check. I have the check stub. I have the. I think I have a copy of the check. The first time someone paid me to direct, and I, I, I think I may have one of those early big speaking checks as well, like a copy of that check somewhere. So cool. So, did you, have you had have you had a job outside of speaking and acting, or has this been your your whole life? You know, like there's people who like work hot dog stands. <laughs> so right. they're like, yeah. like waitressing while they're trying to break into acting and act and that kind of thing. Is is that something you had to do as well? Yeah, I absolutely did. Um, never was a waitress, and that that's just no sh- that's no shade to the waitresses and waiters out there who what bring home money saying? everything night. That, yeah, they bring home money every day with tips. Yeah. But that's just I worked in the cafeteria while I was uh, um, in college. That's as close as I got to working with food. But yes, I had part-time jobs, even a full-time job for a long time. And about two or three weeks before 9-11, I got fired from my last full-time mm. job. And I was like, you know what? I don't think I'm going back to corporate. And I've been very fortunate not to have to go back. Well, I think I think a lot of times people will see somebody who's been acting for a while and not understand like the amount of work they put in behind the scenes to get to that level. I mean, you've, you've obviously been doing this since you were a kid, but like, can you speak to like the auditions, the trying to find an agent, like all that kind of stuff? What was the process like? How many times did you hear no, if you did? I mean, I guess some people don't, but like, what was that? What, what was that like for you? Cause it's, I know it's a grinding process for a lot of people. It is. And uh, we're in a uh, we're in an era now, particularly in the southeast, in both Atlanta as well as North Carolina, where because the film industry is booming, everyone is trying to act. Therefore, the competition is stiffer and securing an agent is harder. So the first time I got an agent, it was not as difficult because I had a recommendation from one of my professors. And so that kind of helped me in the door a little bit. But as I started to grow and wanted a bigger agent, and particularly when I wanted to get Atlanta representation, it was tough. And I was not understanding what the problem was. I was like, hold up. You know, I have credits and this, this and this, and you won't (laughs) even give me don't you know who I am? My name is Angela to the R-A-Y. What? You got to ask somebody. <laughs> but yeah, it was difficult. Um, and there were agents that I applied to multiple times. And I, it wasn't that, you know, they met me and it was like, this isn't a fit. Like, I couldn't even get an interview. And I was like, mm. whoa, is that where we are now in the Southeast? So I can't remember the specifics of how I eventually ha- got the agent that I have. I know that I had reached out to her. I know that I had started following her on social media. I had reached out to people that she was shouting out that she had signed. I was working to build relationships that way. And so eventually was able to, to get an interview. Um, at this point in my career, I'm actually looking at that next level, which is probably a manager along with an agent. Can we talk about this for a minute about going the door is not always right in front of us and the routes that you had to take to almost like circumvent and have like a full on go at it from all angles, like trying to get this agent like social media, like yeah. it, digging in their trash can. You weren't doing that, but I'm just saying like <laughs> trying every avenue to like surround you, surround them with you. Mm-hmm. Like how important that is because i mean obviously everyone has to if you're trying to get out there now whether it be as an author an actor whatever it is you need to have a social media platform um and that's obviously how we connected was through twitter uh what what do you what have you found be successful for you in building your platform on social media Ooh, that's a good question. I feel like my platform is is somewhat consistently changing (laughs) (laughs) in social media. Yeah, because uh, number one, the algorithms keep changing. So what you put out and how you put out changes. I mean, even Twitter, I mean, there was a time when I, you know, what was it? Twitter 
was 140 characters. I mean, the new people don't even know how difficult it was to get what you wanted to get out in 140 characters. But now it's not like that. So things are constantly changing. I think the main thing is consistency. And I'm not going to yeah. say I'm always consistent, but the main thing is consistency and, and building community, not just, OK, here is my stuff, like it, share it, you know, buy it, but also building relationships with people on your social media platform, responding to people as well. Uh, I did an interview maybe a couple of days ago, I think on Facebook Live with someone and immediately people were in my Facebook fan page inbox. And so. On the one hand, it was I was I was a little bit taken aback because someone was like, oh, I'm going to see you because you're going to be at the Southern Women's Show and I'm going to be there. And so I hope that I can get an autograph. And I was like, oh, my gosh. But I was like, no, it's, it's it, yeah, it, I, it, I, I'm I, not really shy, but I was taken aback by that. Like, uh, OK, oh <laughs> yeah. but um, yeah, but that but really being a real person. And, and I'll tell you who is magnificent with that and, and I'm saying this because he actually responded to me and that is Mr. Dwayne Johnson everyone knows as The Rock. I actually, yeah I actually want to see one of his movies and I you know I'm one of those individuals that I especially early on I try not to give away plot lines you know because I, I, I'm frustrated with that when people go to see a movie it's opening night and you tell everything on social media like okay we all didn't get to go see it tonight like don't yeah. do that. So I was very careful not to talk about the plot lines, but just, you know, gave him a shout out about the movie. He actually responded. I was like, what? So of course, you know, I screenshotted that. I shared that on, on all my social media platforms, but, and I know he can't respond to everyone, but yeah. he does respond to quite a few people and engage with his fans on social media. And that's what it's all about. Like that guy is that big, but yet he engages with people. And I think it says a lot. And that's how you build community. Biggest movie star in the world. I've been harassing um, celebrities online since I've got online, and none of them have responded to me. <laughs> well, you said harassing. You got it. I mean, it, no, yeah, I, don't I know. <laughs> <laughs> Lovingly annoy is what I meant to say. Lovingly annoy. I like that. I might put that on a t shirt. You can I hashtag. Annoyed. That is one. I'm going to tell you what. That is one of my hidden talents is like accidentally coming up with uh, t-shirt ideas. <laughs> Everyone's. Yeah, that's like, cool. That's a great t-shirt idea, and I'm like, huh. <laughs> I guess it would be. So, what projects do you have? Do you have coming up that you're? You said something about the Southern Women's Conference. Yes, it's a show called the Southern Women Show. And they, it's hosted in several cities around the South. They do it also in Michigan, but because Michigan is not the South, it is called the International Women's Show. It's actually the same, you know, same organization. But that is coming up this weekend, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in Raleigh, North Carolina. And it's oh, going to cool. be at the state fairgrounds. I will be hosting the Food Lion stage. And so what I really absolutely love about this gig is that I get to be Guy Fieri and Steve Harvey on the same show because uh -oh. I host a version of Family Feud. We call it the Food Line Face Off. So I'm hosting Family Feud and I get to be Steve. And then I also host the cooking stage with our celebrity chefs. So I get to get, be Guy Fieri at the same time. So yeah. That's amazing. Yo, I love cool. I love Steve Harvey, by the way, because he talks about living in your gift and he's he's an amazing human being, the amount of work he does. Uh, oh my so that's God. cool. That's so cool that you get to do that. Yeah, it is. Family I feud. absolutely love it. So when it comes to um, when it comes to hand handling, when it comes to having fans and people who recognize you for your work, how have you responded to it? Like, has it been has it been surprising to you when somebody's like, "Wow, you! I saw you in this. It was really great. You're amazing." Blah blah blah. Every single time it is surprising and you would think at some point I wouldn't be surprised but I remember the Sunday after Love Thy Neighbor my episode of Love Thy Neighbor aired I was shopping at Sam's after church and I heard this lady said there's a movie star in Sam's and so oh, I was looking around like oh my gosh who She's is like, it where yeah I'm looking around like who is it and she looks at me and she says you stole Linda's money and I just busted out laughing I was like oh <laughs> My gosh, she is talking about me. So we had a conversation and, you know, it, that show in particular, because my scene actually made the promo that they were airing, like, you know, throughout the week on the um, own network. And so, yeah, 
I'm surprised so- every time. I don't think about it. I, and I don't know why, even though I recognize people and even people without big names, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's the person that was in that episode. I do it, but I don't I don't even think about it for myself. But yeah, every single time it happens. And there are times I think I'm like kind of low key, you know, let me put on a, a different color wig. Let me put on a hat and some sunglasses and I'm just <laughs> minding my own business. And it's like, okay, yeah. <laughs> Trust me, I know. Every, I totally understand. <laughs> I everywhere I go, you. yeah. Everywhere I go, people are like, "That's the Uniweb guy," <laughs> and I'm oh like, oh, "Not me." <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible because I, I feel like I, is it's obviously a part of acting is especially when you start getting in things that people see. I know that um, starting out when you're in a motel. In somewhere in rural North Carolina, and nobody's seeing it, you're like, "Well, this is fun, but <laughs> I'm not worried about being famous right now." Right. Like at some point, when you start getting these bigger roles, you, that idea of, "Man, I'm really starting to pick up." Like when it's it started, what like four, five years ago for you, right? Roughly, yeah. Roughly five years ago. Mm-hmm. How has your life changed drastically in terms of how you go about your daily? routine like because i know a lot of people a lot of successful people who are who build amazing careers and lives have routines that they do throughout their day that like you know they don't they don't stray from because it's it's how they they they're building their platform and and their career is there something that you do every day to help you move forward i guess besides pray no be and that's unfortunately it's because Every day is so different. It's like I I want to be able to have more of a routine, but particularly as of late, it, I feel like I it, there's so many things coming at me from different directions that I have to adjust and be flexible. Because if I don't adjust and I'm not flexible, either A, the stuff doesn't get done or... Yeah, or it runs me crazy. So, yeah, mm. I don't have a, a set routine. I mean, most of the time, it, you know, the morning time is for me uh, when I can take that in the morning. If not, I try to flip that to the end of the day. And then it's usually on to email to see, A, do I have an audition? When do I have time to work on it if I do? And just figuring out the other elements of my day. And then, you know, if there's travel involved, you know, packing, unpacking, all that good stuff. Are you comfortable talking about what prayer has done for you in your life? Oh, absolutely. Um, okay. it, it's, it's been a game changer for me. I mean, that okay. that is, I think, that, no, not even though I think I know, that is why I'm saying, because even though people, sometimes people may look at prayer as, oh, that's how you were able to get the success. It's not even just about the success. It's just about maintaining sanity, because as you said, there's a lot of rejection. <laughs> There's a lot of rejection in this business. Yeah. I mean, a lot of rejection. And sometimes that rejection can feel personal. Like they didn't want me when it's not really, it's not, you know, most of the time it's not even about you. Sometimes it's not even about your talent. And then the things that happen outside of the industry that happen outside of, you know, the career. Like I remember a, about 10 or 15 years ago, I was directing a play. My mom was set to come up to help me just, you know, kind of help me behind the scenes. And the mm-hmm. night before my dad calls to tell me that my mom is in the hospital. And I'm wow. like, oh my gosh. So it's, so I, there, there really wasn't a time for me to adjust. So I'm directing a play at night. And during the day I was driving an hour and a half mm-hmm. away to where my parents live to spend the day in the hospital with my mom. And that went on for about a week. And so wow. prayer definitely helped me get through that situation of feeling that I couldn't really be there for my mom the way that I wanted to be because you know, I was committed to this play that was going up at the same time that she was in the hospital. And so there are always the personal challenges that happen that people don't think about. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily consider myself a celebrity, but, you know, we've seen people like a, a Janet Jackson lose her brother while she was shooting a movie with Tyler Perry. I believe she was t- shooting Why Did I Get Married too during that time. And so, you know, you have these personal challenges and yet sometimes, you know, you're just keeping going. I- I've looked at the comedian Ricky Smile. He has lost about three or four people very close to him in the last like month or so. And so he's been pretty, um, 
transparent on social media with, you know, I'm going out and I'm on stage and I'm making all these people laugh. But inside, I'm sad right now because, you know, I just had to bury an aunt or uncle or grandfather. And so getting through those challenges when people still expect you to be you, to, to give your all when you're on a platform, when they're paying to see you and get the best of you, prayer has definitely got me through those days. Wow, that's powerful. Yeah. I, I mean, it's it's something that's been power, powerful in my life, too. That's why I, I love talking about it, because, you know, the, the power of prayer and, and even, you know, meditation for me, too, has been something that, like you said, that sanity, that barrier between me and the insanity that does go on in the rest of the world. It's like, yeah, if it's not there, then I'm a I, some there's there's days I'm a mess. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I pray, I get I get pretty livid in my prayer, too. Um, like there's that talk of giving, giving wh- however you feel, mm-hmm. um, do you, do you kind of let it, cause you're an actress too. So like you're, you're, uh, emoting, you emote, you're good at that. Is, is that something you bring to prayer or you, do you just do normal? Like <laughs> God, <laughs> like yeah, I can get caught in that sometimes too, but uh, I think it just I think God it... wants to see us like. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I I think that um, there's a little bit of both, Um, you know, definitely, you know, sometimes, you know, prayer is for me is about listening as well. So, Mm -hmm. you know, knowing that I I need answers, I need direction. So and then sometimes it's I'm, you know, excited, I'm filled and I'm giving that back in prayer. So it's it's a little bit all over the place. I don't know if I've been, you know, I'm not quite that huge and dramatic or whatever, but yeah. You know. Every time, like when I pray over meals and stuff like that, people are like, oh, "Bro," <laughs> and I'm just like, "God made me like, I'm, <laughs> like <laughs> hey, He created this sense of humor, okay? He like he he thinks it's funny." Um, <laughs> so, somebody out there does. So with uh, with auditions, with filming, have there been like, I always like asking this too. Have there been like times where you've been like, "Oh my God, I can't believe that happened. That was the worst, absolute." thing I've ever done in front of a camera? All the time. Uh, no, <laughs> Every I day. Say, no, Every I shouldn't say all the time, but it, <laughs> but it has happened. Or there have been times when I've bombed, you know, what I feel to be a big audition because my mindset wasn't right. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't think I've done, I, no, I take that back. The, my very, very, very first agent, who is not even in the business anymore, I hadn't even signed with her yet. I think she was sending me out to kind of, you know, okay, this, let me send you out for this audition, see what you think, see how you feel, whatever. It was an indie project. I don't even remember the name of it, but I just remember, I don't even remember the role, but what I do remember is that I looked in the camera. And of course, unless you're playing a news anchor or a reporter or a host, you're not looking in the camera. And I was, and I knew better, but I was so nervous. And it was like, when I finished, you know, they were like, Thank you so much. That was so great. I was like, I was supposed to do that. I know I wasn't. And I, and honestly, I should have asked to retake because, you know, in your audition, that time is yours. I don't know. remember how far I had traveled, but that time was mine. And I should have said, you know, I looked into the camera. I was a little nervous. I would like to do this again. I felt comfortable and confident enough to ask that now. But at that time, I was just like, oh, gosh, that was horrible. You were just and, like, I'm going to get the heck out of here. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to go run and hide. So for people who are uh, just starting out in the business, what kind of advice would you have for them in terms of either looking for an agent or going to auditions or like where they should where they should uh, maybe stick their toe in first to try to get their foot in the door? I would say there are a couple things. One, um, if you have no acting experience whatsoever, I would suggest doing some extra work on some films because that will teach you a little bit of set etiquette. You'll learn like kind of what it it is like to be on a set while the pressure is not very high on you because you're working background. So that's one thing. Then secondly, uh, I come from the theater and I think theater is excellent training ground for film and television. So if, you know, someone has an opportunity to audition for a play, even to understudy, I think that's another great way to get training. And then in terms of an agent, I would first go to the Screen Actors Guild SAG after his website and look mm-hmm. up the agents that are listed there because they're unfortunately in this business where you don't 
just get a job because you have the right training, because the barrier to entry is very much an art than an exact science. There are a lot of unscrupulous people out there who are looking to prey on people with big dreams. And mm -hmm. so I would look at the SAG after website first in terms of, you know, a, you know, looking for a, a particular agent. But I would definitely have experience before even trying to get an agent, because unless you have something very unique going on. Let's say you're you are you're one of a triplet, like your triplets. That is something okay. very unique, and so you may not have a lot of acting experience, but because of that uniqueness, you have a better opportunity to get signed with someone. I just imagine myself walking into an agent's office with one of those things attached to my body and like two yeah. two dummies of me, yeah. like <laughs> I'm a triplet. Yeah. Like, <laughs> But th yeah, I've seen people who are either even I say triplets, but even twins, you know, twins yeah. often can get an agent easier than an individual with even more experience. So I, I mentioned triplets, but it could be that, you know, maybe you represent um, an under an underrepresented ethnicity. So mm. maybe you're a Pacific Islander or. Um, you know, there's not a lot of white guys in television, is there? I, you think I'd be I'm, I I'm mean, pretty much like know, a unicorn. I, 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 <laughs> I haven't seen that many of them. I mean, you know, it's hard to find a white dude on television for real. So, I mean, I think you I should go for it. it. <laughs> I should have no problem. <laughs> None. Zero. Zero. Yeah. But th that's another way to, to get involved. But, you know, training and and uh, just being really careful about what you even invest your energy in because, there are times that I get auditions and sometimes it's not necessarily through my agent, but I'm kind of sifting through like, okay, who is this director? I'm going on Google. I'm going on IMDb. I'm trying to find out as much as I can about the project before I even decide if I want to audition because auditioning is an investment of my time. Sure. So I, I really want to be like, careful. It's, an with it's a job interview, right? You it's a go... job interview and you have to, some you have to prep for more than others. And what I mean by that is it just depending upon how much, how many pages you have. I mean, I, I had an audition, I think last week it was six pages and uh, it was definitely a great project. Uh, we'll, we'll see what, what happens with that. But, you know, really wanting to be prepared for it. Do you memorize all the lines? Nine That's times out of 10, I am off book. I'm Yeah, I am off book. That's incredible. That's a talent in itself, I think. Like, oh, it's a talent that you have but also are able to develop over time especially since you said you did theater I, I mean you're not like holding they don't have cue cards or like they're not holding it you're you got to be off book there too so that's a i'm sure that's a great training ground do you ever feel like you get really extremely nervous before a theater show um Sometimes it's been a, so I took an intentional break from theater theater. I love it is my first love, but it's time consuming because right. you're in rehearsals anywhere from two to four weeks before you do a show. And then you may have a three or four week run of a show. And this is like, you know, regional theater. We're not even talking about like off, off Broadway, off Broadway, or on Broadway, how long those shows can go and how long those rehearsal processes can be. But mm -hmm. that being said, I took an intentional break, but in 20, was it 17, I believe? 2017, I uh, stuck my toe back in theater and was fortunate to do a play that is has been touring intermittently. As a matter of fact, I just spoke with the director and producer about two weeks ago who said he's looking at us traveling to Alabama in June. So... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, a little nervous, but theater is my first love and I feed off of the audience. That's the one thing that you don't get in real time in film and television is feeding off of that audience because, you know, it's a cut. It's a you know retake or whatever. But theater it's live and in the moment and you just got to keep rolling with it. Well, for like sitcoms, though, like uh, Love Thy Neighbor, that was in front of a live studio audience, right? Or well, no? a smaller audience. It's not okay. quite the same as. The same. Um, yeah, not quite the same. It gets me nervous just thinking about you having to get up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it. I mean, again, I just I, I think usually I'm less nervous the more I am prepared. But it just yeah. you know it really depends. I actually, it's funny. Mm -hmm. I just got an award um, 
a little while, uh, a few days ago, uh, the Atlanta Actors Awards. And for some reason, I was nervous going on stage to do my acceptance speech. And so one of my friends saw it. Thank you. Um, One of my friends saw it and I said, I don't know why, but I was nervous. She said, you know, I did notice you seemed a little bit more out of breath than normal. I said, that's because I was nervous and I don't know why, but yeah. (laughs) I guess it's like somebody's acknowledging that you're good at acting and you get up there and you like blow it. <laughs> you sound like a, a doofus. They're like, wait, wait a second. This lady won what? <laughs> I did not want to do that. And so maybe that's what it was. But yeah. yeah. What um, I was going to ask you, too, because like, have you ever missed the line in the live show? And we talked we were talking about improv before I started recording, have you ever missed a line in a live show? And ha- like, you got to keep going, I assume, when you're on st- stage. So have you had to completely improv it or how's that work? Yes, I have. I will never forget my first, it wasn't actually theater. It was, um, it was actually poetry. I was a part of the Ebony Readers Onyx Theater when I was at UNC. And so Ebony Readers was the kind of spoken word literary part onyx theater was the theater part and so Mm -hmm. we were uh doing a performance to kick off homecoming week and i was doing maya angelou's phenomenal woman and Mm -hmm. you know a very well-known poem very beloved poem that uh dr angelou wrote and for some reason i went blank like i couldn't remember the poem but being somewhat seasoned in improv I kept going. And so I, I guess I did it with such uh, confidence that when I came off stage, someone was like, oh my gosh, where did you find that version of Phenomenal Woman? <laughs> like they thought it was a new version. I, I mean, I, I did it confidently. I just kept going. This is you the know, unabridged I, version. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I wish I had a recording of that as well because I don't know what what I actually said, but yeah, you just you keep going. And, and then sometimes I'm on stage with someone who may what we call go up on a line and you keep going. And, you know, there is a skill called feeding someone the line where if you, let's say you and I are on stage and you forget your line, I may ask you a question that has a part of your line in it to kind of get us back on track. So I've had to do that as well. I feel like people would be feeding me all day long. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, come on, Matt. I'm like looking at birds or something. <laughs> it's a, it's an amazing skill, and I, I applaud anybody who, who takes the risk to go out there and and uh, put themselves in the light of other people's eyeballs because it it can be a terrifying thing for a lot of people, um, and it takes a lot of bravery, courage, and also talent. And uh, it's it's really cool to get to talk to somebody who's been who's been living that life for a while now. It's it's exciting for me. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I um I know it's something that I've I've entertained the idea of. I've been doing a lot of short films like myself. It's much easier to make them myself because I'm the only one that can I'm like directing myself. If somebody else is telling me how to do something, I'm like, "You don't know. I'm an art- <laughs> I'm an artist." <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea what you're talking about. Did it, was it was it difficult for you to take direction in the beginning? No, it wasn't difficult for me to take direction in film and television or theater. But I will say that when speaking, particularly when I was getting coached with speaking initially, when I and this is like out of college, I was not very coachable at first. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that you know I had won some awards and, you know, I had some achievement in speaking. And so I thought no one could pretty much, t- I thought I was just good. Yeah. I was good, but there's always room for improvement. And I think right. I'm a much better speaker once I learned to be coachable and take the direction. I, I really became a much better speaker. So, yeah. yeah, for whatever, yeah, I think I had just, I had one too many trophies at that point, and my, my ego was a little bit too big, and it, it was a little bit difficult to take that direction and, and, you know, critique, but I've definitely gotten better because of that. I think that's one of the hardest things to actually comprehend is that m- most of the, the greatest speakers and actors that get out in front of people and are able to do these amazing things are extremely humble people who are just like so focused on getting better and honing their craft that the idea of them knowing it all or like being this amazing superstar is even in their mind like silly 
because they're like, I have no, I like, I'm just learning every single day because it is, it's a, it's a craft you're constantly working on. Are there some workshops and, uh, acting classes or coaches in, um, that you would recommend or any kind of improv or anything like that, that you would recommend people go out and try? Um, Dave Pelegi does a really good business class on acting. Um, he's in the Atlanta area, so I definitely recommend him. Um, on the, I have not taken an improv class in forever. And I, it's, it's, I don't know if it's lazy or it's on the job training, but the amount of hosting that I do, I'm very fortunate that that keeps my improv chops really, really sharp. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm constantly thinking on my feet when I'm hosting an MC, you know, I have some talking points, but other than that, I'm making it up. And, and like for the Southern women show, I'm on stage for like 10 hours a day. So that is great That's, training. <laughs> yeah. What do you do? Like what? Are you just like pulling every rabbit out of the hat you can? Like are you? Uh, well, so like, do you have I, tricks I that you use to keep going. <laughs> You know, there, there's some things that I use over and over again, but because like I mentioned, it's, you know, I'm, I'm part Steve Harvey, so I'm hosting a version right. of Family Feud. So honestly, I'm very fortunate that the people who are a part of the show, they give me material. Like, you know, yeah. sometimes the answers that I get, I'm like, are, are, are you kidding right now? So right. I, a lot of it has, I've been very fortunate to be able to, to get the material from, from the audience, you know, just feeding off of them. So that, that's a lot of it. Yeah, it is. That is one of the, the best parts is getting to interact, I guess, with the audience. But there is, I've always, I've always wondered the, how, like how to know how far you can go with somebody. I always get that concern because I've got a pretty twisted sense of humor and sometimes I feel like I can go a little bit too far with people. But I, I guess when you're on on stage or on screen or whatever, people are kind of willing to go a little deeper into their own. <laughs> I, you know what? I'm going to be honest, Matt. I sometimes feel like I'm tiptoeing on the line, too, especially when someone gives me a crazy answer. But most of the time I have... I, like you said, people kind of laugh and go with it. And sometimes people know they told me something crazy. Like, really? Yeah. Like they, they, they know that they said something that was just ridiculous. So, um, yeah. And, and not making any, you know, kind of joking with people, joking with them instead of laughing at them. Um, I think that that makes a difference too. But yeah, yeah. there just been times I'm like, did you really just say that? So, like, yeah. are we, is this, <laughs> am i being punked is this real yeah. life yeah it's amazing um I, I really do appreciate you taking the time um to come on and talk to me it's been a pleasure getting to know you and uh thank you so much thank you for having me on i appreciate you taking the time to interview me i'm very busy i have a lot of uh things to do here <laughs> today <laughs> i've got a I gotta take a nap in a minute. <laughs> right, very, right. Very sleepy. It's always weird because, like, I've, I've, like, welcome to my bedroom. I invite <laughs> people to my. It's you know, okay. You were talking about you were talking about your friend. I'm terrible at ending interviews, by the way. You were talking about <laughs> you were talking about your friend daring you to do a poem. Mm -hmm. Like it's I, I wrote something about following inspiration the other day. The whisper of in inspiration in your in your head that we follow all these different things, but that whisper that's told us, you know, oh, that looks fun, I should try that, or oh, that's interesting, I wanna do that. But there's always that fear and doubt that no, I can never do it, no, I can never do it. And I've, I started listening to this whisper that was telling me, Matt, why don't you uh, start a YouTube channel, or why don't you write a book, or tell a story? And then it was like, why don't you interview authors, and why don't you see if anybody wants to come on? And, and just following that whisper, of just do this, just do this has led to me doing like 80 plus interviews so far in, in two and a half months out of my bedroom, which is crazy, right? But <laughs> it, it, it almost, it doesn't make sense. Um, so when, like, like I said, jokingly at the beginning, when I asked you, did you lose your mind? <laughs> like you're wanting to come on because it still blows my mind that I've had any success in doing this, but it's just listening to that voice in your head. that's like, no, you can do this. People are interested. Go for it. Just try. Just try. Just try. And then life opens up. Absolutely. You take one step and then boom. You just keep taking one step at a time. 
it's mind boggling because we 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 see it from like day one and then we see day one million and we don't see the like you said we don't see the hundred yards of field in between the mm-hmm. little celebrations in between but it, like you said it's important to take that time and celebrate those things in between so we do recognize how the the whole journey because it's not like it's not day one to day millionaire it's day one to day two to day two and a half it, and it's mm-hmm. such an incredible journey and i'm so glad that you decided to stop in and, and experience this incredible show <laughs> <laughs> humble, humble are we matt humble <laughs> it's one of my great character traits humility yeah yeah well thank you so much and uh like I said, I'm terrible at ending interviews. Bye. <laughs> Do this. Okay.